All right, I'm excited to be here today with my new friend, Matt Santry. So Matt is the founder of Well-Paid Musician, uh, which offers training, community coaching, and focus on helping musicians, specifically performing musicians and DJs, to be able to break six figures annually with their music. He himself is an award-winning songwriter with song placements on HBO Max and Peacock Networks. As a session vocalist, his voice has been featured on national ad campaigns for brands that you've you know, probably heard of, like NBC's The Voice, Dollar Shave Club, Febreze, and more. And you know, aside from doing this himself and building a very successful career as a live performer, now with Well-Paid Musician, he's helped hundreds of performers all over the United States to be able to grow their performance business, to increase their fees, to be able to stay in high demand and create a lifestyle business that they love, uh, sharing their talent with the world. So I'm really excited to have him on here today so he can uh, geek out a little bit and talk about specifically what's the roadmap look like for, you know, as a musician, what's the roadmap look like to actually build a six-figure business as a live performer. So Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I'm really excited too. And I've been following Modern Musician for a while. And uh, we have some mutual friends and mutual members of our community. So this is, uh, yeah, this is a great fit. So yeah, for I, I feel the same way. I feel like it's overdue. I've, I've heard great things about you. And this is the first time we've really had a chance to connect. So looking forward to it. Uh, so Matt, maybe you could, we could start out for, you know, for anyone who this is their first time connecting with you, could you share a little bit about yourself and, and your story and kind of how, how you started your own career um, growing as a live performer and building you know, the company Well-Paid Musician now? Sure. Yeah. So you gave me a nice introduction with the bio, um, you know, some stuff that I've done in my career. I am a singer, songwriter, I'm a performer, but, but mainly I would say live performer because that's really what's generated most of my income. So um, I guess like the origin story of how I started this program was um, seven years ago, my wife and I, well, my wife is pregnant and I'm like, okay, um, at this point, I think it makes most sense, you know, for you to be a stay home mom. And, you know, I just need to figure out what it is that I need to do to generate more income so that we can, we can have this lifestyle. So I made a decision to stop playing those kind of bar club gigs. Now I'm talking about gigs where you play cover songs, you play other people's music that, you know, um, they're pretty easy to find. They don't pay that well. And you have to do a lot of them to make a living. So um, I just started focusing. I said, look, I'm going to set a minimum fee and I'm just going to focus on private event gigs. And um, it really, it just kind of changed everything really quickly in that I was able to like two and a half times my, my, the fees that I was getting before that, that I was making just by shifting the market to private events. So I started doing that. It was working. And then I started helping my friends do the same kind of thing. And then, um, you know, just before the pandemic started, I, uh, I launched this program and, and, uh, it's been, you know, we've been helping, like you said, hundreds of musicians all over the United States achieve the same kind of thing, that transition from, you know, doing a lot of these bar restaurant club gigs to being able to make that same amount of money that you'd make like in five gigs, doing it in one, mm -hmm. being more focused about your career, having a better lifestyle business. And then I've also found that a lot of our members are also artists. So we, we have some members that are also members of your community that have, you know, that are in the modern musician uh, program. So it's, it's a pretty cool intersection. And um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how it started for me. Am I remembering correctly that uh, Logan on our team now yes. is, is one, one of the students? Yeah. I mean, he, I, I remember specifically yes. he's, he's described his experience, you know, going through your community, going through your programs, and it's made a huge impact on his own, his own life as well. So yeah, I, I, I see that uh, first, firsthand, even though it's the first time that we've met, I, I yeah. the, Logan is one of the leaders on our team and uh, the live gigs and, and this specific process you're talking about has made a big, big impact. You know, there's something about that idea of, you know, what is it like the 20, the 80, 20 rule and, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. doing less, doing mm -hmm. less, but, but getting better results, doing less, but doing more at the same time. That's just so, so interesting. And, and maybe, maybe you could share a little bit about um, that philosophy and that idea, specifically as it relates to what you're talking about with, with shows and about um, different quality of shows. And, and maybe you could describe, 
you know, now that you've you know, worked with hundreds of, of artists, you've probably seen some of the same patterns and some of the mm -hmm. reoccurring um, themes or mistakes that people are struggling with when they first come to you. So maybe you could share a little bit about what are some of the biggest challenges or mistakes that um, that you see when, when artists start, first start working with you? Absolutely. But first, I, I got to give a shout out to Logan, Logan Thomas. He was one of our first uh, success stories. And I mean, that guy, he's he just, you know, he gets it. And mm -hmm. he's, uh, you know hardworking, talented dude. So he, he's the reason why we're talking today. So shout out to Logan. <laughs> um, but speaking of that, that's it's mindset. So it's funny that you mentioned the 80 20 principle. That's one of the things that we get right into in the mindset section. It's like if you can visualize your year's worth of gigs, right? Look at it on a calendar and you, you figure you, you probably have to do 150, 200 gigs to make a certain amount of income so that you can cover all your expenses and you know versus if if you were to cut that down to a third or a fourth and make more money i mean that that's when it like the 80 20 principle uh, i'm sure you've talked about it you know in your podcast but anyone that's unfamiliar it's it's basically like the small percentage of things that yield the biggest results Right. It's all about leverage, essentially. And so if you for with with the gigs, finding finding the ones that will pay you, you know, the, a premium uh, versus trying to go out and fill your calendar. Um, I, th I think like the biggest mistake coming in is a lot of performers have this kind of scarcity mentality. And it's like I have to take I can't say no to anything. I have to say yes to, to it all. Even if it means, you know, I'm going to basically break even on a gig, um, you know, I'm getting like a sandwich and a beer, <laughs> you know, like um, <laughs> you can say no. And it's actually better to say no and focus on that like 20 percent that's going to yield, you know, 80 percent of your results. So, um, you know, it's, it's that mindset. And I think what happens is when uh, the performers come in and they start to get that first win or two, they're like, oh, wow. Wow. Yes. Now I see it because it's like reading a book on how to swim. You can read all the books on swimming, but if you don't get in the water, you know, and, and experience it and learn, you know, how to float and how to do you, you can't swim. So mm -hmm. it's the same thing. Once they start seeing it in action and, and they're getting the gigs and they're getting paid, but it's like, oh, oh, yeah. OK, that that's really where the mindset, the mindset shift happens. So. Mm -hmm. Mm. Awesome. I, I love that analogy. Uh, learning the theory, the theory of how to, how to swim versus actually yeah. doing it, being in the water. Um, so, so maybe you could describe a little bit about you know, sort of the um, the things that people can relate to. You know, basically, like as it relates to playing, you know, bar gigs, playing restaurant gigs, sort of the experience that that they're having. You know, what are some of the the main um, challenges that come with that? with those specific types of gigs um, versus like, what's the contrast or what's like the difference between you know, having more premium gigs, like in terms of quality of, you know, not just like the, the pay, but also maybe like the quality of the shows themselves mm -hmm. or the yeah. value that they're providing. Yeah. So um, I know, you know, this through your program, we talk about like high ticket um, clients or, or, things that you can offer right and i think the like big misconception is people assume that the more someone is paying you the more micromanaging or the more they're going to want for you or their expectations are going to be so it's it's actually the opposite it's like i find when you go in and do like a hundred dollar bar gig that's when you have the manager asking like well how many people did you text how many people are coming out tonight um, you know, your your break was five minutes too long versus, you know, uh, just last week playing a, a show, getting paid two thousand dollars to come perform at someone's house. They were so grateful for me to be there. They were just like and, you know, forget the money. It's just yeah, the quality, the way that you're treated. It's like, you know, almost like you are some kind of celebrity. They're just like, um, you know, you they can't express their gratitude enough that that's the kind of thing you feel like they're throwing the party and you're actually a guest there 
You know, it's like if you had a rider that said, you know, I need to, uh, you know, this specific, uh, you know, chicken done this way and, you know, the, no brown M&Ms, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, <laughs> that's the treatment you get. Like, would you like anything to drink? Would you like to make sure that you get some food? We, you know, that kind of thing, like, I love. It's so, it's just night and day from, yeah, the bar restaurant kind of grind. So that's the biggest thing. And And then what I find is, too, um, a lot of these events seem to be like big moments in people's lives, whether they be anniversaries or birthdays or, or weddings or, or whatever it is. So, so you had a part in that special moment and that in itself is just um, really gratifying too, mm -hmm. to be a part of that and see like the joy that you're bringing um, to someone's, you know, big, life um you know milestone moment mm. yeah that's that's beautiful super well articulated and you know the um I, I can relate a lot with what you're describing around these specific kinds of concerts or, or private performances and the experience and the value of you know when when someone you know if you did one a free bar gig you're playing the show and people aren't really paying attention it doesn't seem like people really care whereas the house concert or the private concert you show up and you mentioned like it's almost like celebrity status or it's sort of like you know, people are so excited they get so much more value they're more so much more grateful yeah you know, it's it's interesting um you know there, there's that phrase uh, it's like i heard it in like the digital marketing circle i think for the first time but you know that people vote with their dollars uh it was the phrase people vote with their dollars and you know that you know the uh, money is sort of like a, a way to symbolize value. It's a way to objectify value as best as we can. And so, you yeah. know, if someone is willing to spend more money or invest more money, it's showing their what they value. And so, mm -hmm. of course, someone who values you enough to you know to pay a thousand, two thousand dollars or more for a show, it is demonstrating that they care. It's demonstrating that they value Absolutely. that what you do is worth it. Um, so, I, I love. I love that you know, you've been able to really help artists focus on on that aspect and realize the value, the value mm -hmm. of who they are and what what they offer. Um, maybe you can speak to that a little bit in terms of because I'm sure that that's probably a big mindset issue for some people, yeah. just fully understanding or realizing that what they're doing is valuable and that they do deserve you know, to be able to you know offer mm -hmm. their services for premium prices. Yeah, um, it's really awesome to see. So in inside of our community. Um, I love when people share their wins and you, you see these definite, like, I didn't think, you know, I could do X, Y, Z. And here I am, you know, six months later. Um, yeah, that's, that's the kind of stuff that that's why that's my favorite part, um, is connecting with all these performers, you know, musicians and DJs, um, because I get a boost, you know, a mood boost after, interacting with them and seeing that and uh so yeah it's just like what i was saying before you you have to experience it to really change the mindset and then once once you you start to feel more valued then it's just easier to continue to grow your brand raise your prices and just really feel better about what it is that, that you're doing and and feeling the value that you're providing Awesome. So uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about your you know, friend who's here right now, who you know, maybe has been playing playing shows, has been working really hard on on their music, and they've been doing a lot of those you know bar gigs or restaurant gigs, and taking anything they can for the sandwich yeah. or for the you know the yeah. free food. <laughs> um, where do they get started? Like, what's the how do they start? You know, finding and get and seeing these opportunities for more premium gigs, and and yeah, where what's the first step? The first step is to map out your customer's journey. So if I am, you know, if I'm going to have a 50th birthday party, I'm going to put, you know, a decent amount of planning into it. And so I am most likely going to do one of two things. I'm going to do an online search and see what's out there, or I'm going to ask around, like who knows people. So, so it's like, you know, your, your Google, um, presence or your uh word of mouth right your referrals and your brand 
So if you can map that out and really uh, understand the process that people are going through to find entertainment for their event, um, then then you can you can show up where you need to show up. So, um, you know, for instance, if you just do a simple Google search on what it is you do. So you say, like, I'm a wedding DJ and type that in. You're going to see, you know, some what well, you're going to see ads for sure. And you're going to see organic stuff, but you're you're going to keep seeing the same things pop up and you'll see lead platforms. And that's a great place to start, you know. Um, booking agents try to get into that mix, too. But what we focus on is, you know, the DIY approach. How do you do this? Because if you're working for a booking agent, you're not going to be able to make as much as doing this yourself. So I think it's really important to map the customer journey to understand, you know, where it is that you need to be uh, in order to, to be hired for these type of events. Mm. Super smart. Yeah, there, you know, there's another uh, phrase in the digital marketing world that's you, know, you, you want to enter enter the mind of your customer enter enter mm -hmm. the conversation that's happening in their heads and it mm -hmm. seems like that's sort of a, a take on what you're saying right now in terms of mapping out their customer journey and getting in their shoes and understanding who they are and what are they going through when they're looking for what you offer yeah um so as someone who you know obviously has a ton of experience understanding you know, the customers that you're serving and, and now you know sharing that process with other artists as well um, at a high level, like what does that customer journey look like? You mentioned you know, maybe doing an online search. Yeah. Um, what are some of the, the kind of big pieces that an artist who's listening to this right now really needs to make sure that they have dialed in um, mm -hmm. to be able to start attracting some of these opportunities? Okay, well, let's think about how we're, even if we're getting a referral, even if we're not doing an online search, we're, we still need to see something, a presentation, right? So your video. So we're going to start with performance video. Mm -hmm. um, and what I think, you know, there's so many ways you can do that. You, you can do like the home studio clean recorded version. You can, you can do it live. Um, but the main thing is you want to have something called a unique selling proposition. And essentially that's a way for you to, not have to compete like you can make the competition irrelevant if you have something that is that you can offer to a client that serves their needs and and really that's the biggest thing it's what's in it for me but the me is your customer like what what, what are they looking for what do they want if you can demonstrate that thing in your video then that's really you know what you want to focus on because i've never met you i've never heard of you I haven't seen you live. Um, maybe maybe someone told me that you were you really good. And I got a referral, or maybe I found you online and you had a bunch of reviews. But still, you you have to. There's that kind of intangible quality that has to come through in those videos that say, okay, this is the person. This is exactly what I want. Um, and you put the potential customer. You 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 put them in the event. Like you just make it easy for them when when they're watching your performance videos to say, oh, this would be perfect for my party, my wedding, whatever it is. So um, I, I kind of combined two things there. So <laughs> the unique selling proposition, but it has to, but the video presentation, that is really, I mean, without that, how how are you going to know, uh, you know, what someone does or, or, or you know, what they sound like or anything? Mm -hmm. Super smart. Yeah, so so sounds like what you're saying is that you know, one of the most important assets that you need to create is a good highlight video or a good video that can demonstrate, that can communicate um, what you offer and, and the service in a way that speaks to the customer and what they're what they're looking for and demonstrates exactly. um, you know that that you have what it is that that they're looking for. Um, right. It's interesting in, in regards to like the unique selling proposition. Um, what does that, what does that look like? Or in terms of like examples of like, um, a unique selling proposition for like a live performing artist, what are like some angles or some things that, that, um, come to mind when you think of like a good, um, unique selling proposition. And if someone here is trying to 
you know, I know it can be kind of hard for, for all of us to have mm-hmm. perspective on yeah. ourselves and like, what is it exactly. that you know, makes me unique? Exactly. Um, but yeah, how, how might someone start to uncover that and, and think about cr- figuring out what is their unique selling proposition? I think the, the simplest way to do it is ask your fans, your customers, people that have come to your shows, people that have watched you perform and find that common thread. What are they saying about you? Um, and I think that's the best way too. Um, but if you break down what is a unique selling proposition, um, it's the appearance of uniqueness. Okay. So you, we all perform, we all do certain things, but we want to appear unique to the client. I, I kind of, I get into this, um, you know, in our free training. So we can, you can, we can discuss that more later. But um, the second thing is the, the relevance to the client. Like I said, like what's in it for me, like maybe, you know, you are an award-winning songwriter, but that might not be the thing that's relevant to the client. They, they may care more about like, how are you engaging with a crowd? Right. And then the last aspect of it is just, it has to be simple, like an elevator pitch, you know, short and sweet. So um, a good example of one of our members who does live looping um, and can entertain, you know, crowds of like a couple hundred people just by himself. Um, his is the the one man band that can pack the dance floor all night. Like hmm. that's really powerful because it's super unique. I can't do that. Um, it's really relevant to the client if they want to have you know, um, like a wedding type uh, reception environment or a corporate party where we want people to dance. I know that this person can make that happen and I can save a little bit of money because I don't have to hire a whole band when this guy can do the same thing. So it's like it's a lot of things rolled into that short statement that really like if I'm looking for an entertainer, but I want to be live and I, and I want him, you know, to, to be singing and doing things, but um, I want to make sure that the energy is there like that. That's going to win, right? That's going to win every time. And I'm not going to get that gig because that's not that's not my specialty. So I think, um, you know, carving that out and, you know, like so that specific example. Try to apply that to your own brand. Um, ask your fans, ask the people that come to see you perform and try to find that common thread. What are people saying about you? And, you know, use that mm-hmm. that three step format of um, the unique sell, selling proposition to stand yeah. out. It's super smart. Yeah. And there's something so powerful about the art of asking and, and learning how to ask, especially the people that you're looking like your customers and your potential mm-hmm. uh, people you're looking to serve. Like those are definitely the best people you know, to, to ask questions. And so you can understand them and you can, and you can you know, quote unquote enter the conversation happening in their mind and do everything that, that you're talking about. Um, how, how, uh, how would you recommend asking uh, in, in terms of like framing it? You know, like I'm, I'm sure you know, if you ask uh, a fan, a bystander, you know, what's what's my unique selling proposition? They might be like, wait, yeah, wait, wait huh? what does that even mean? <laughs> exactly. Um, so so how, how would you recommend that like artists kind of frame that question? And if they are looking to get that feedback from their, their fans or their friends or family or really whoever they have that knows their music right now? Yeah. Um, just simple questions like, um, why did you come see me perform? Um, and then what? what did you like best about my performance and what makes my performance unique or special? But before you even ask like detailed questions, you just make sure you listen because you will probably get some gold like right off the bat, you know? Um, and, and so actively listen, you know, don't just wait for like the next question, <laughs> like make sure that you're, because, yeah, you might not even have to ask many questions to, to get some really good feedback. Mm. So good. Yeah, the, those questions are, are gold. And yeah, gosh, I mean, it just, it helps so much to like getting that validation, that feedback as well. I'm sure like, you know, asking those, those questions, especially if you're early and you're starting out and you don't, you're not totally clear on, you know, what is what it is your unique selling proposition, what makes you unique and what's the value that you're giving to people. 
um, when you ask those questions, it kind of, it, it draws that out and it helps you understand it. And yeah, I'm sure that's going to be a big confidence booster and validation booster yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, that's never thought of it that way, but that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, absolutely. Cause I mean, you do want people, to, if you ask that, you know, what can I improve upon? You could do, look at that, but you know, you're, you're going to get positive feedback and that's definitely going to open your eyes to some things and maybe you didn't even realize that you are good at. So yeah, I can mm. definitely see how that would, you know, bring up your confidence level too. That's yeah, that's pretty cool. Mm. You know, I think it was maybe Tony Robin who presented this idea and it's, you know, he's not just he who talks about this, but um, that the quality of your life is dictated you know, primarily by the quality of the questions that you mm. ask. And so if you're asking questions internally, like the voice in the head is like, you know, why, why does this always happen to me? Like, you know, why, why, why does, why does the world hate me? <laughs> you know, like if we take like a victim mindset, then we're asking sure. questions. And, and when we ask questions, like we get answers and our mind crafts, you know, answers to the questions that, that we ask. And so, you know, our ability to actually ask the right questions to ourselves and to other people can, you know, hugely dictate the experience both for you and the other people. You know, if you ask people, you know, on the flip side, if you ask people like, you yeah, know, what did you really not like about my presentation? Or like, what was like the worst part of it? Yeah. Then they're probably going to walk away and, and they're going to be remembering like, oh yeah, like, you know, there's this thing and this thing that like I didn't really like, or there's X, Y, Z versus just by asking them that question, like, what was your favorite part? What made it unique? Um, you know, that's going to also create a better experience for them. It's going to help them remember and take away, you know, some of the best, you know, pieces of, of what you offered. So yeah, it's yeah. kind of interesting. Absolutely. And even just framing, like, you don't have to be negative. Like, what did you just, Hey, what, you know, what can I improve upon? That is such a better mm. way to frame that question versus like mm. almost like planning this assumption that there was something wrong. Like there wasn't because a lot of times they'll go, uh, nothing. I, I honestly can't think of anything. Like I, get that feedback a lot, you know? Um, so that, that's cool, you know, but yeah, I, I do, I, it is all in the framing for sure. Yeah. And, and that is, I mean, that is such a, a valuable question to ask, you know, what, um, what can I improve upon? Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it takes a certain amount of, uh, confidence, I think, or the ability to, you know, to, to take constructive feedback without taking it yeah. personally. Um, oh, so that's, oh, that's everything, man. That's everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we could talk a little bit about that too, because like yeah. that is such a core, like you know, it's yeah. almost like a human level foundational um, skill to develop um, is the art of you know learning and being able to take constructive feedback, not personally, but but grow from it, while also yeah. being able to distinguish between. Um, you know, not all feedback is you should take completely to heart and say like I'm going to change everything about everything exactly. I do because of this one person. Exactly. Um, so yeah, how how do you recommend that people? use um constructive feedback and, and approach those types of uh, conversations i wish i had a great answer for that because i feel like it's just a continuous process that we all go through right um but if you don't have some kind of buffer and separation from the feedback uh you will get swept up in either you know, positive or, or negative. You can fill your head with <laughs> a lot of things that aren't necessarily true that could be positive or negative. So um, I wish I could, I wish I could tell it because I was not like, I have that figured out. What, what I have learned myself is the more that I look at what I'm doing as a business and less of just me, Matt Santry, I can separate that. Like, oh, you didn't like this one thing. That was your feedback about the business of what I did. I don't have to take that personally versus like, mm -hmm. you know, you suck. <laughs> and we've all gotten that through our careers. Some point, somebody told us we suck. And that's just part of life, you know, and that hurts, right? And and no one wants to hear that. But I've found that, yeah, just like treating this entity as a business, nothing is for everyone, right? Like we all have our preferences. You know, and, you know, you can like chocolate ice cream and I can like vanilla ice cream and that's totally fine. Or we don't like ice cream at all. And that's not something that you need to take to heart emotionally. And so I think viewing yourself as a business, even if it's your own name, right, as a performer, being able to 
like take that step back and say, well, uh, that's not necessarily me, you know, that, that it's my name on the brand, but it, this is my, my business and this is for everyone. So that's okay. And that's what's helped for me. It's just that separation. So mm. hopefully that's helpful to people. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's super smart. Yeah, it sounds like what what you're saying is that it's important to be able to separate your identity from the feedback and your identity mm -hmm. from yes uh, your business exactly. And you know, I, I never read this book, but I've heard the book come up quite a few times in like different conversations around like growth growth mindset. I forget what the name of the author was, but I, the book was all about um, growth Zwick, mindset. I think it sounds sounds right. And I don't have the book? audiobook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it might have even been called growth mindset or something. Yes. I'm sure if you Google like yeah, growth mindset. Yeah, I think it's mindset. called the growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But but I remember like the main takeaway was sort of about what you were just describing, which was that what she found through a lot of studies and, and research was that um, the people who were able to you know achieve uh, the most success and, and and create a fulfilled life uh, and were people who were able to grow and who, and specifically like the the big contrast or the big difference was that they didn't um, identify themselves as like a fixed entity or a fixed yes uh, exactly like like they realized that they could they could evolve they could grow they could change and that um, you know if they made a mistake or if they failed in some way, that it wasn't a reflection of of their identity, um, but it was just something that they could learn from and that they could use to grow. And it kind of reminds me of, of what you just described around not taking things personally, not identifying with them. But you know, if someone truly thinks that they're, they're a fixed, you have a fixed identity and that can't evolve or can't grow, then when you get negative feedback, then you know, you, you have to rationalize why the other person is wrong, or else it kind of cuts down. Your right. ego, like it cuts down your identity. Totally, but it does seem like a superpower to learn how to um, how to observe and how to you know get space to get space to be able to take that in and take what's valuable and you know leave leave the rest. Yeah, absolutely. I think you you nailed it. And it's like it's not like something you achieve either. It's a practice. It's mm -hmm. just a part of your life. So absolutely. I agree with that 100%. I'm just I'm look, picking up my phone because I have it on Audible. It's called Mindset, and it's mm. yeah, it's Carol Dweck, D W E C K. So if anyone wants to check that out, awesome, <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I, I personally haven't read the book, but I've heard great things about it. So it's probably yeah. it, it probably is a worthwhile one. Um, cool. Do you have any experience with um, yeah, in related to that, like getting perspective, getting space, um, not taking things personally. Um, meditation as a practice huh. it seems like it's been Absolutely. really really helpful for. I was actually that. gonna gonna bring that up. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Well, go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, I was, just, I was gonna ask um, you know, for anyone who's here right now who either has like a meditation practice or has thought about it or um, you know is, is curious about meditation. Um, what, what does your practice look like, or what do you recommend for people? I know this is a little bit tangential to some of the stuff we're talking about, with, like booking gigs, but you know it's you important. talked about it at the beginning the mindset. It is, exactly. It is really important. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm going to say uh, like 2014, I think it was, I, I discovered um, the uh, Headspace app and I committed to that for a, a year of doing it every day. And I didn't achieve every day, but I got pretty close and, and it really did help a lot of things. Um, I just discovered Sam Harris's waking up app, which is pretty cool because uh, he, there's also like theory lessons in there too so i've just started with that um because i my meditation practice i've kind of fallen off the wagon recently and i <laughs> like i want to get back into some i'm trying something new um mm -hmm. but i think most importantly is just like uh setting aside at least 10 minutes to do it and i think why you even brought this up is because it's um in line with what we were just talking about kind of that separation of yourself like your identity and you and on all these things it's um when you can witness your thoughts and witness your emotions then it's a lot easier to just kind of let them pass versus like i guess the best analogy i heard was like in the storm you can be outside in it getting rained on 
or you can watch it from inside your house through the window and experience it in a different way. It's still there. You're not controlling it. You're not making it go away, but you can, you can witness it uh, without being taken by it. So mm. yeah, mm. we're getting really deep that, here. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. No, that's a, that's super powerful. I, I like that analogy too, with the, the storm and, and I've heard kind of like, yeah, the clouds passing by sort of analogy before. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up Sam Harris. Uh, he's, he's come up a few times in conversations recently uh, mostly around like uh, free will conversations and um, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a whole rabbit hole that will yeah. circle back around to me <laughs> for an, another conversation but um but yeah it, it does it does seem like uh, that practice of learning to observe and, and seeing you know the voice in the head uh, doing its thing and how it it generally we tend to identify with it we just think it's who we are we think that the voice is us but yeah. you know if you do sit down and you just you you observe it like you realize man like that thing is just it's just going like the mind like you know it's not something that that we're you know consciously you know thinking all of the thoughts like they just it just happen um but it does allow you to get more perspective to be able to kind of reclaim reclaim the owner seat a little bit when you can take a step back and you can observe what's actually happening in in your mind absolutely yeah cool well, uh, hey Matt, this has been this has been awesome. I love conversations like this. I feel like we touched on yeah. some you know, super super practical and, and valuable business advice around you know, the eighty twenty rule and you know focusing on providing more value and serving people and and getting into the the head of your customer, understanding where they're coming from, their journey, so you can show up in the right place. So I was like, you're know, starting to build some of the assets you know required in order to you know in order to communicate who you are and the value that that you offer to those those customers. So. Um, yeah, I know you mentioned. So first of all, th thank you again so much for coming on here and sharing some of your lessons and, and advice. And um, I know you had mentioned that you actually have a free training that walks yeah. through in more details some of the specifics around the roadmap and how to you know, get started and and build you know performance business like this. So maybe you could share a little bit about um, what that free training looks like and and how to join. Yeah, absolutely. So I've essentially talked about it throughout this interview. Um, in, in the pieces like step one, mapping the customer journey, step two, developing that unique selling proposition. Uh, and then I guess the third piece that I didn't talk about that's in the training is, is list building, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's essentially like a, a proactive way to create word of mouth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, create, you know, a referral network. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's the last piece. And that's really where, you know, the snowball effect happens and, how we see members break six figures annually, which is, which is really awesome. Um, so that's all in the, the training. Uh, I'll put a link I'll make a special link for uh, modern musician, the community, and you guys can check it out. I guess it'll be in the description of the podcast here. Okay. Yeah. We'll, yeah. Well, like, like always, well, for easy access, we'll, we'll put all the links in the in the show notes. And cool. Uh, and thank you for for putting that together. And and just in general for, you know, for sharing the the lessons and what you've learned. You know, this is very clearly something that you've done for yourself. And it takes you know a huge amount of work and energy and learning what doesn't work, and learning things some things that that work. And so it's great that you know not only did you go through. The challenge is to make this happen for yourself, but now you're actually able to share this and help other people with it. It's pre pretty awesome. So appreciate the the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I really appreciate being here today, and I love that we went off topic and got creative and a little bit spiritual and a little bit. Uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> it's, what, it's what the music space is all about, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's no, all, that was super included. fun. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, yeah, like, like always, we're going to put all the links in the show notes. And uh, Matt, it's great, great connecting and looking forward to our next conversation. Thank you, Michael.